So if you're just joining us, we're moving through the book of Ephesians. I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Ephesians. There's an outline in your bulletin. If you'd be so kind to remove that, we're going to utilize it this morning. So I wanted to ask you, I, I, I think I know the answer to this, but have you ever been to one of those outdoor markets or maybe a swap meet and just wander through the aisles? Is, is that most of you? So you're familiar with what that looks like. And sometimes they're selling produce or fruit, but then occasionally you'll come across a booth where someone has taken something that was dilapidated, should have gone in the trash heap and made it into something beautiful. Craftsmen, that's what they are, master craftsmen. I've seen pieces of furniture that nobody saw any value in, and they took a, a table or a dresser or a chair, and it's a masterpiece. It's the kind of thing that people buy, and they put in the center of their home. Or I've seen pieces of wood, old planks, that really weren't even good for fire, for fire kindling, and someone took that plank and they put a beautiful saying on it in calligraphy and now it hangs in someone's entrance way as a statement about their family. This right here was something that Mike Churchill found. It was at a yard sale, was given away, had no value, an old fan that didn't work. And he saw something in it. And so he went and put light bulbs, attached a new cord. And now this is a light in his office. When you think about these individuals, they look at situations and items differently than the rest of us. They, they see the potential of beauty. And sometimes they call this repurposing. Something that should have been thrown away has been repurposed and used for something of good. That's exactly what the Bible teaches that Jesus has done for us. Let me show you this passage that Paul penned to the Corinthians, his second letter. I want you to read it out loud with me. Let's say it together. From now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. This brief statement parallels what we're going to be studying in Ephesians. What Paul was declaring is that you and I, before we came to faith in Christ, saw everything through a lens of the world. It was completely worldly. And as a result, we had a different value system. We looked at people differently. If they didn't look like us, respond like us, think like us, we didn't see value in them. And even before we came to faith in Christ, we didn't see the value of Christ. We looked at him through a lens of curiosity and oftentimes perplexity of thinking, who is this guy? But Paul says that when you put your faith in Christ, you are a new creation. You have a new nature. You have the spirit of Christ that enables you to see things from a different vantage point. And all of a sudden you begin to realize that Christ created you for a purpose, And this was accomplished. You and I were sinners. We were broken. There was no value in us, and we were destined to hell. But Christ Jesus came out of his home in glory and then gave us life. He repurposed us. He put his spirit in us. And now we have been created for him to do good works in Christ Jesus. And so Paul is going to help us to understand how does that happen? If you're with us last week, the previous verses presented the assertion that when we first came to faith in Christ, we were infants, we were babies, spiritually speaking. But the expectation is that we would grow up just like babies when we dedicate Casey. There is an anticipation that Casey's gonna grow to 12 years of age. She's gonna have a maturity that's gonna understand that Jesus Christ loves her and wants to be a part of her life. We have that expectation of babies Scripture says that Christ has an expectation of spiritual babies, that we will grow up into him who is the head. But what Paul is going to help us to see is that that repurposing or renewal happens as we respond to the Spirit. That you want to have a responsibility. 
It's Christ's work in us. The word oftentimes used is sanctification. It's Christ's work through sanctification, but you and I need to respond to the Spirit. If we're constantly saying no to God and no to the Spirit, we don't grow up. We don't experience what we've been repurposed for. And so Paul's gonna give us three actions today that point to the way that you and I can continue to growing up in Christ and really experience the purpose that we've been created for. We're gonna study verses 17 to 24 of chapter four, but I wanna begin by reading verses 17 to 21. I want you to notice the contrast that Paul is painting the way we used to be and how we are now in Christ. Would you help me to honor the Lord if you're able to stand as I read that passage? Paul penned Ephesians chapter four, verse 17. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you've learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. Thank you. May be seated. Last week, I mentioned that Paul first arrived in Ephesus around 54 AD, starts sharing the gospel Individuals started coming to faith. Pretty soon, the church started growing. I referenced that Ephesus at that time was a quarter of a million people. It was the center of an economic boom. And in the middle of that was the temple of Diana, the goddess Diana. And the practice that went on there was paganism. Prostitution was a part of the worship. And so here are these individuals that have been indoctrinated by a worldly point of view, all of a sudden are finding out the things that they put their hope in that continued to fail them, that there was something real, there was something that they could actually trust and know that it was going to be reliable and consistent. And so they put their faith in Jesus. But as you move forward, God is working in the culture, but it's still a few years away that as the church really began to share the gospel, that it reached a point where the economy was failing because one of the major industries was building idols of Diana, and nobody wants to buy them anymore because they love Jesus. But until that time, there is still this influence of the world, and they'd come out of this kind of worship, this hedonism. And when I went back and I reviewed the historical nature of what was going on in 54 to 60 AD, when Paul writes back to them, is it looks just like Southern California, just like Southern California. We live in a culture that's exactly like Ephesus. In fact, you don't have to go to a temple to be bombarded by lust, by materialism, by humanism, it's constantly in our face. You can't avoid it. And what Paul is recognizing that some that have not grown in their faith, they're not that distant from a life that they once had, are struggling. They're having a difficult time to not go back when they've had a problem, when they're disappointed, when they're discouraged, to not go back to a practice that brought them comfort. And I share that to recognize that it's possible that there's some of you present today or online that feel the same way. Before I make the statement, I want to restate what I just did. You and I are here because of grace, not because you're sinless, not because you haven't failed, not because you haven't gone back to the temptation of the world. You and I are here because Christ Jesus paid for our sins. But I want to say to you, if you're struggling with pornography, if you're using drugs, if you're addicted to alcohol, if you're going to these locations, you're, you're enthralled by your entertainment, you're numb by your hobbies, and God feels distant and a long ways away, I want to say welcome. Welcome today, because Christ has the power and the means. If you put your faith in him, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, and he's going to help us to understand that. Here's the first thing he's going to tell us. How are we repurposed? We're repurposed when we recognize futility. When we start growing to a point 
where we can discern what is meaningless and pointless, and we choose the alternative, we choose God and what he has for us. As you take note of that, look at verse 17. If you're just joining us today, realize, in fact, I want you to always bring your Bibles because we are rooted in God's word. It's God's ideas that matter. Verse 17, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Let's, let's just take a moment, slow down and unpack what he's saying. When he says, I insist on it in the Lord, what Paul is saying is this isn't my opinion This isn't an idea that I had. This is of God, and he's making it emphatic. You and I are to live this way because Christ Jesus commands it. He expects it from us. And as he goes on, and you should then, therefore, not live as the Gentiles. Now, what is he talking about there? Realize that in the first century, that's a term we would say the world's. That you and I should not live the way we used to when we were in the world. We were apart from God. We had no consciousness of the Holy Spirit. He said, that should stop. And then he adds a clarifying statement in the futility of their thinking. He says that the worldly ideologies, the philosophies are futile. They're meaningless. And as we go deeper, we're going to see some examples of how they literally, when you put them against truth, they do not make sense. And he wants us as believers to realize, to look logically at how futile they really are. Look then at verse 18. He's going to explain how this happens. He says, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. That's a long statement, but worthy of us unpacking and understanding. If you go back to the beginning of the verse, he says, they're darkened their understanding. They don't have the light of God, which means that they don't understand spiritual things. They see things only from a worldly point of view. Everything is what they can touch, what they can see, what they can taste. And in a moment, you're going to see how that plays out into their behavior and how they live. He says they're separate from a life of God. This darkness prevents them from actually realizing that God is there, God is available, and God wants a relationship with them. And then he goes on to make the subsequent statement is that this is because they're ignorant and this ignorance then has been a result of the hardening of their hearts. Okay, let me back up one more time, take a quick pass through that. And I want you to think of it in a very relevant term. He's gonna talk about a certain segment of society, but right here in this verse, he's speaking in general of those that have not come to faith in Christ. So let me pause for a parenthetical. If you're here today, or you're online and you've not put your faith in Christ, this in no way is meant to be demeaning. It's to be clarifying with the hope that you will put your faith in Jesus and love the Lord. So essentially what he's saying is your neighbors, when you think about your neighbors, is that the reason that they have not put their faith in Christ is there is a hardening of hearts. You say, how does that happen? When God presents truth, it doesn't matter who it is. When God presents truth, and that person rejects that truth, the Bible teaches their heart becomes hardened. They become more resistant to the truth. And and in a moment, we're going to see more specifically how that happens. And so anybody, if you've shared with your neighbors, some of you have family members, and you try to talk to them about the Lord, or you tell them why you go to church, and they don't want to hear it. They're like, hey, that's great for you. That's just not my deal. What's happening is you don't realize that spiritually speaking, their hearts are becoming hardened. And the more hardened it becomes, they become more ignorant about spiritual things. They don't think about that there is a spiritual world and a spiritual realm that's acting in very real ways all around them. There's an oblivion to that. That's why he uses the term ignorance. And when he's talking about this ignorance, he says one of the results of that is that they don't know it, but they're separated from God. When you sin, if you're a believer and you sin and you feel a certain distance from God, even though, th- even though logically and theologically know that he will never leave you or forsake you, you know what it's like to feel that distance from God. And you also, I trust, know what it's like to feel the presence, the closeness of God. They live in oblivion to that whole idea. That's what he's declaring. And there is a concern, there's a burden. He says, If we now have met God, we've tasted the goodness of God, why would we go back to living in that oblivion, that ignorance that doesn't know that God is there and he's offering us solutions to our difficulties? But here's the real kicker. Look at verse 19. He's going to talk about what is the next sequence of events that happens. 
Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they're full of greed. Now, you're looking and you're thinking, that's not my neighbors. That's, that's not my relatives. Praise God for that. But what he's declaring is that individuals that continue to deny the truth will continue to move farther and farther away from God. And what they'll be driven by is their own flesh, whatever brings them pleasure, whatever makes sense to them. Now, I'm going to say some things here that I want to be really clear about to give a better emphasis and understanding of how this works. If you go back to those friends or family that don't know the Lord, and they're not oppositional against you and your faith, they're not saying, you're so dumb to go to church. Why would you believe in God? They're, They're not oppositional. But if you really want to test to see if what Paul is saying is true, start speaking about things that Scripture says that are contrary to the culture. One of the things that he's stating is, is that the culture rejects truth. When you reject truth, in fact, he says to Timothy, as he's writing to him in his church in Salem, he says, they've exchanged the truth for a lie. There is a time when I was in my 30s or 40s, and I'm like, really? I, I don't know if I see that, you know? All my friends that don't know God believe in God. I never would have dreamt that there would be a day where educated people, professionals, would be proposing that a five-year-old child should choose their gender. When I hear that, whether I'm a Christian or not, I'm like, that doesn't make sense. If you have a college degree and you study human development, a five-year-old child can't make up their minds whether they're going to have peas or carrots. And yet you're going to believe that they can choose their gender in spite of the obvious evidence that God has made them a boy or a girl. Now, I go back to that. There are those who don't oppose God that listen to that ideology and say, well, maybe, you know, we, we don't want to be harmful to children. Or I'll go a step further. If you study the Bible and you see what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, and he makes it very clear that this same passage is paralleling for those who choose same-sex relationships, and you start saying that my God is opposed to that, you begin to see that they have a very different opinion about truth. See, we look at this in kind of abstract ways. We don't think of it practically of where we live in Southern California and what we face. And Paul says, there's a problem with that, especially especially if we go back to thinking the way that the world thinks. At that point, we begin to experience some of the same problems. And one of the things that he talks about is that they've lost sensitivity. Do you see that in verse 19? Is that their conscience doesn't necessarily have a conviction or feel that's wrong. I would do it, but it's okay if you do it, is kind of the mindset. It's the mantra. And he says they've lost sensitivity. Again, when he writes to Timothy, he describes it as their conscience has been seared. Seared means it's like a hot iron that hits some skin and it burns it and it creates a scar and it loses the same kind of sensitivity the skin would have. As he used that metaphor, he says, when you keep saying no to truth, you begin to deny conscience and you sear your conscience. You become insensitive to spiritual things. Let, let me share you an example in my own life of what this looks like, and then, and then we're going to move to seeing how this happens. So I don't know about you. For those of you young, maybe it isn't the case. But for me, uh, especially going through college in the 80s, uh, all kinds of television programs and, and movies and stuff that I would watch. And I didn't really, I didn't watch R-rated movies, so I didn't really see a problem with them. Well, now you have streaming. And I remember when my kids were in high school and we turn on streaming and there was a movie from the 80s that I watched and I thought it was hysterical. And I'm like, we should watch this. And we turn it on, and like five minutes into it, I'm like, oh my gosh, where's the, where's the remote? Turn that off, turn that off. And my kids are like, what? And I'm like, this is awful. And they said, oh, I thought you said it was funny. Well, it was funny in the 80s. It's not so funny in the 21st century. <laughs> well, what are we talking about? We're talking about the fact that not being spiritually mature, this is what Paul's talking about, not being spiritually mature My conscience didn't feel any conviction about the innuendos or the scenes or the language. But now, it's like, wow, I see this from a completely different perspective. That's what Paul is saying, is that that's the trajectory we should have in our spiritual lives, not going backwards to where our conscience becomes even more distant and there's no conviction whatsoever. 
This actually, the Apostle John will pin this very thing in a very succinct way in John chapter 3. Famous passage, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he sent his one only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. We stop there. We don't go on to John giving an explanation of why. If Jesus came, you and I know people, we've told them, Jesus loves you. He came to this earth so that you could have eternal life. Why would you reject that? Here's John, John's explanation. Let's read it together. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world but people love the darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. What was John saying? How does it parallel to what Paul is teaching us? He's saying people reject Jesus. He is the light. That's one of John's favorite metaphors. Jesus is the light. They reject Jesus because, and, and here's what's so ironic about that. They reject Jesus because Jesus is the truth and the light Jesus exposes their dark deeds. I hear people all the time, hey, I, I, don't, I don't have any issue with Jesus. He, Jesus is great. He loves everybody. When they say that and they're choosing to continue on a path of darkness, it tells me you've never read the writings of Jesus. You never took the time to actually hear what Jesus has to say because John says, if you did and you love your sin more than you love Jesus, you'll reject that. You'll keep going into darkness. That's what Paul is saying. He's given us the progression of what that looks like. Spiritual blindness is enamored by the darkness. Can I repeat that? Spiritual blindness is enamored. They love the darkness. They don't know anything different. It just makes sense. It's something that's enjoyable to them. Why would you do anything different? Let me give you an illustration that'll help move us to how that may apply to us. I shared last October, Monica and I went up to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho for our anniversary. Had a long weekend there. And we're right on the Coeur d'Alene Lake. Beautiful place. There was one day, there was no rain. It was beautiful outside. And there is this hiking trail that goes out on the peninsula right by the harbor in Coeur d'Alene. And so it goes all the way around. And as you get to the backside of this hill, you start going up the hill. And then you descend back down to where the harbor is. And so as you're on the backside... There are all these trees, and it kind of forms this canopy over the trail, a lot of shade. And then you break through this canopy, and then you can see the harbor and the boats and the sun shining there on the water, and it's beautiful. And so as we came down, we went to a park, and we sat down on a bench just to watch the boats and the lake. And Monica looks over at me. She says, what's that bump on your neck? There's like a bump underneath your shirt. And I'm like, really? And I feel like, well, that's weird. And it felt kind of odd. And she pulled the collar back, and this is what she saw. Big old, nasty, ugly, brown spider. And without telling me what it was, her hesitation goes, bam, hits the back of my neck. I'm like, why did you do that? Why did you hit me? And about that time, the spider comes flying off and lands on the ground. I'm like, thank you for hitting me. Oh, my goodness. Sometimes... In order for us not to get stung by the culture, God will slap us on the back. I'm just saying. You're saying, well, that's kind of an interesting opinion. No, it's, it's not my opinion. It's Hebrews chapter 12. Right? Hebrews says this. He said that God disciplines those that he loves. Cornerstone family. He disciplines those he loves. And he goes on to say that no discipline is pleasant. Nobody likes discipline. It stings. But he says it's necessary and it's good and it's profitable because over the course of time, you actually grow into righteousness. You have, a, you have a righteous fruit. You have a clear perspective. You've got a direction to follow. So that's what Paul is saying in this larger text is that God's going to discipline you. He's going to help you to have the right perspectives so that you don't fall back in these worldly ideologies. There's, if you're taking notes, there's four things I want you to write down just before I give you the, the action on this. Um, the first one is develop discernment. What he's is saying indirectly in these verses that we need to grow in our understanding. And as a result, we need to have a discernment about how we see the world. The second thing I would encourage you to write down is then clarify your values. What do you actually value? 
In a moment, I'm going to give you an example to have this make sense. Because when you have clear values, you begin to realize that your values of God are very different than the world's values. Because this is oftentimes where we get thrown off guard. And then from that, we begin to recognize its futility. We begin to realize that makes no sense. It has no benefit. And all of a sudden, faith becomes very logical. It makes sense to trust the Lord. And when you do that, it exposes your indoctrination. Hear me on this. There's not a single person here that's not been indoctrinated by the world. We we are ignorant and not mindful of how much our thinking process and our decision-making process is based upon what we have learned from the world, not from the scriptures. Here's one example. Monica and I moved, it's crazy to think, it was almost 23 years ago we moved to Claremont. And about 10 years after we moved there, the housing market had exploded and the prices went up. And there was a new development closer to Glendora. So I'm commuting from Claremont to church here in Glendora and these beautiful, large new homes. I'm like, wow, if we sold our house, took the equity out, we would have enough for a down payment. Sure, the payment would be larger, but we'd be in this nice, new, beautiful home right close to church. But because of God's mercy and his grace, by that point, Monica and I had begun to develop a value system. And we started thinking about what that would mean of having a larger home, more taxes, bigger payment. And when it came to our finances, one of the things that was growing is that we did not want to have excessive debt. We wanted to reduce the debt so that money could be used for kingdom purposes and for our children's development and their education. And we began to realize that that choice, even though we could afford it, we could get into that house, that choice would be contrary to the value system that we had adopted. And hear me on this. That is contrary. If, if, if you take a posture, and I'm not, this is not meant to be a transcendent principle to all of you, but I'm telling you that if you take the posture that less is greater, it's contrary to the world. Because if you live in an apartment and you're 35 or you're 40, and people are like, are you ever going to own a home? Do you ever think about buying a house? You know, it makes the most sense, right? If you're in that place, people are challenging you from the world and saying, well, that's not success. Or let's say, for example, I look at a number of my single friends that are here, and you reach 35, 37, 40, and you start being asked, are you, are you going to get married? Or you've, or you've lost in your first marriage. And there's a question, are you going to get remarried? And the whole idea is, is that being married, owning a home, is a measurement of success. That's what your life is supposed to count for. If you study scripture, that's not what scripture says. Your value is not based on who you're married or how big your house is. It's based on who you are in Christ Jesus. This is how this text breaks down and applies to us. So here's the action that comes with that. Rest with Christ's assertion. On each of these actions, I'm not going to elaborate. I just want you to go to the passage, but I'll give you one idea of what you're going to find. When you go to that passage in Matthew, Jesus is going to teach that's going to challenge your idea of authority and submission as well as opposition. He's going to say, you've heard it say that you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, you should love your enemy and pray for them. I want you to wrestle with your own value system and see how much of it's really rooted in the world because the world says, why would you love your enemy? Why would you pray for somebody who opposes you? Also in that, why would you take their pack the extra mile when they demand you to take it one? Why would you go another mile? Why would you work extra for your boss when he's not compensating for you? Do you see how we make our decisions and choices based upon a worldly yardstick? All right, here's number two. We're purposed, repurposed when we change our thinking. And we start adjusting how we view things and how we address things the way that Christ would do. Okay, look at verses 20 and 21. Notice the contrast he begins to paint. That, however, is not the way of life you've learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him. What is Paul talking about? He's talking about when he was there for three years, he taught them the gospel. He discipled them. And he started by saying that you can't earn your way to to heaven, that God's favor is not merited. It's by grace alone. By grace through faith are you saved. 
And he says, don't go back to using the worldly system of merit, thinking that you can gain God's favor, that if you do enough stuff, he's gonna answer all your prayers and give you exactly what you want. He says, you know better than that. We've taught against that. He says, you were taught in the truth according to Jesus, not the world's truth, Jesus' truth. Then look at as he goes on in verse 22. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. The assertion I would make is that grace is the compass to godliness. Can I restate that? Grace is the compass to godliness. What Paul is essentially arguing in this passage is what he also argued in Romans when individuals said, wait, you mean... We don't get into heaven by being sinless or perfect. We get into heaven by putting our faith in God, in Christ Jesus, and it's by grace. And he says, yeah, absolutely. And their argument was, well, if I'm not being condemned for my sin, then I should just sin whenever I want to. And he says, wrong. Don't go on sinning so that grace, so you think grace can abound. You have been given this amazing gift to resist temptation and stop sinning for the grace and the goodness of God. And so when he makes that statement, he's declaring that grace is to help us to see what God has done for us, and not because we're obligated or we have to so that we get to heaven, but because of all that he's done, we say, Lord Jesus, we want to follow you and obey you. Obedience is driven by a completely different different motivation. And he says, that's what I taught you. That's what you should know. But one of the things that he's alluding to when he says, put off the old self, one, there are many factors, but one of the most prominent things is the fact that you and I are selfish. When he talks about our flesh in Romans, he's talking about the fact that our flesh is selfish. We always think of ourselves first. In some groups that I've been hanging out with lately, I go back to the men's breakfast a week ago yesterday, and they had some questions about our responsibility as men and one of the things that was talking about, in fact, Mike Churchill was the one that shared this one story and he opened up conversation where he talked about the fact that it really has annoyed me when I'm waiting to go into a street, go into traffic, and I'm making a right or left turn and I see one person coming from my left and I'm anticipating they're going to go straight. And the last minute, right where I'm at, they turn in. And he says, I say to Audra, why don't they use their turn signals? I'm waiting here. So I get an amen. That's the one amen I got. So some of you feel the same way. How many of you feel like I felt sometimes where I'm trying to merge onto a freeway and there's someone that's clearly not from Southern California and they don't know what merge means and they think it's a stop sign and they stop trying to get on the freeway and I'm like, go. Let me get a little bit more personal. I don't see a lot of college students here, so I'm going I'm to initiate it with college, but I think it happens in our homes. You go in the next morning to make something for breakfast, and there's dirty dishes in the sink from the night before from your spouse or your child or your roommate. And immediately, what does your thought think? They always do this. They always leave their dirty dishes for me to clean up or laundry. You've all had that experience at least once where you go in and you open up the dryer and you just want to take your clothes out and put them in the dryer and there's a whole load that's probably been in there for two days. <laughs> and of course, because you're all so godly, you fold it neatly and you place it <laughs> on your loved one's bed where Pastor Bruce would probably drop it at their doorstep or throw it on their bed. <laughs> hey, there's this. <laughs> I've never got this many amens in my whole sermon. Okay, so selfish, yes? Paul says that we need to be not centered on self, but centered on Christ so that we're other-centered. That, that's, that's the underlining point that he's driving home here. Notice how he goes on. How is this going to happen? I'm going to back up one more time, verse 22, to take you through 23. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, that selfish self-centered person, which is being corrupted by its evil desires. Evil means it's always about me. It's always for me. But he goes on to verse 23, to be made new in the attitude of what? Your minds. Change the way you're thinking. Stop thinking that you're the center of the universe. Start thinking that Christ is the one you center on and you focus on and you, you look to him. I'm gonna share an illustration that will bring us to our, our application and then our take-home truth. Some of you know my son, Tyler, 
It's hard to believe that this summer he'll be in Texas for nine years. And anybody that knew my son, he's truly a Southern, Southern California kid. Loved snowboarding in Big Bear, riding his dirt bike across the Lucerne Valley, surfing beaches up and down Orange County coast. And then he moves to Texas, but he just never lost his Southern California vibe. It could be 32 degrees out. He's wearing his Hurley board shorts. He's got his rainbow flip-flops on. All of his buddies are like, French, this is Texas. Why do you keep thinking you're in California? He goes, I'm a California kid. Well, that changed this last Christmas. You know how you can send your wish list, your Christmas list on Amazon? And I'm looking at it, and it's like, camo jacket? Duck collar? Waiters? Wait, did I get the wrong list? Who is this from? So I call him up. I'm like, dude, what's the story with your Christmas wish list? He said, oh, yeah, that. He said, well, remember when I moved out here at that time? It was eight years ago. Remember when I moved out there and I started working with the sixth grade boys in my youth group? I said, yeah. He's crazy to think they're all seniors now. I said, three months they're leaving for college. Every one of them are going to college, Texas A&M, Oklahoma University. And they'll only come back on holidays. And they love to duck hunt. And I figured that if I dumped my Southern California vibe and I clothed myself in camo, that when they came back, even though they've graduated, we'd still spend time together. I just want to be present in their lives. Here's a picture of them. <laughs> yeah. And if you look at those 18-year-old boys, there's great joy to be hanging out. I want to share that story because, because that's an image of what Christ did for us. Christ dumped his glory. That's what Paul says in Philippians 2. Christ dumped his glory and clothed himself in flesh so he could be present. Christ dumped his glory, clothed himself in flesh so he could be present in our lives. And Paul says in this passage and in Philippians chapter 2, that's what you and I are to do. We're thinking not only of our own interests, but also the interests of others. Their attitude, our thinking should be the same as Christ Jesus. So when we start thinking about Christ, what's the action that we should take? We need to think like Jesus. We need to behave like Jesus. We need to look like Jesus. And the action that comes with that is we need to adopt Christ's attire. When you go to that passage in Mark chapter 10, you're going to see James and John still measuring by a worldly value system. One is sit at the right and left of Jesus when he enters into his glory. And you're going to see Jesus saying, you still have the wrong value system. He says, you think that being important is about being served. He says, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. And he says, if you want to be a part of my kingdom, that's what you do. So as you take a look at that, you need to note Christ's selflessness, but be honest about your own selfishness. And I want you to write down three things. One I've already given an allusion to, but please write these three things down. Success, value, and respect. Success, value, and respect. What I want you to do is I want you to determine how you measure those things. What's your yardstick? Do you measure your success the way the world does? I've already given the example of you're in an apartment and the world says, well, why don't you own a home? Or you have a car that's 20 years old. Why don't you have a new car? If you're measuring your success and you're using the world, it's going to be frustrating, disappointing. And I've already talked about values. Measure your values. How do you measure your values based upon the world does? And then here's one that I think the first two are pretty obvious to us, but I mentioned respect because I think that one flies under the radar. We don't realize this is the deal. Every single one of you, including your pastor, longs for respect. And many times the things that we're buying, the things that we're chasing after, deep down inside is we want to be respected by the people around us. We want them to realize that we are a success, that we have value, that we matter. And this is an area where the Lord has really, really convicted me on through the years. And there was a time going back early on where God showed me that this longing for respect was an idol in my life. And the things that I was doing to try to get people to respect me. And one of the things that the scriptures that the Lord brought to my attention is he said, Bruce, what does it profit you if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? What is he talking about? He's saying, what benefit is if you get everybody to like you and you haven't done what I've asked you to do? And that was profound. That was convicting to me because it showed me that 
many times I, as a people pleaser, I'm chasing after the respect of others, not really thinking about what does God respect. So as we think about how this fits, it, it can be very personal and very convicting, but it brings us to the big idea the take on truth is that we are repurposed when we embrace Christ. This is where Paul's been heading. The, the solution for all of this is a deeper, intimate love of Christ. I want to finish by just reading verse 24 and closing with two comments. Back up with me, verse 23, so you see how his thoughts flow. To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness. To put on the new self. That's where we started today. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. That means daily you need to put that on. You need to think about what that looks like. And you have been created to be like God, to be like Christ Jesus. God's will for your life, Romans 8, 29, that you and I be conformed into the likeness of God, the likeness of Christ. And he says, in true righteousness and holiness, the reality is, is that at that time, there were people in the church, and it was also, it was in Ephesus, but it was also in Corinth, where they're having their own self-righteousness. They want everybody to see their gifts. They want everybody to see how spiritual they are. And Paul says, that's not true righteousness. True righteousness is that we are being changed from the inside out by Christ Jesus. And what begins to happen is, is that love then becomes sincere. It's authentic, not fake. And so he calls them to begin to put on this new, this new identity in Christ Jesus. How many of you heard uh, the violin called the Stradivarius? Any of you? A few of you? So going back 20 plus years ago, there was this godly man named Wayne Wright that was in our church. When I led senior Bible study, I got to know Wayne. He was actually one of my neighbors when we lived in Cabina. Just loved this man. So unpretentious. One day I was over at his house and he brought this old violin out. And he says, uh, have you ever seen one of these before? And I said, yeah, I've seen a violin. And he looked kind of weathered and looked like it was really old and maybe not worth much. He goes, have you ever heard of a Stradivarius? I said, no, I never have. His Stradivarius is one of the most valuable instruments on the planet. He held it out. He says, this violin in my hand is worth a quarter of a million dollars. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> he says, yes, because of the maker, there are so few. They are absolutely valuable. He said, I want you to take it and use it as a sermon illustration at church. I'm like, I don't think I should be carrying around a quarter million dollar violin. I drop all kinds of things, Wayne. You just don't understand. I went online this week and I looked up the current value of a Stradivarius in pretty much any state. It's between one and two million dollars and can go up to seven million dollars. Now, let's just imagine, let's just imagine someone opened up a storage, they bought a storage and they found this old violin and they took it to a, a swap meet and they put it out and they said, you know, I want $1,000 for this violin. If you don't know the distinction of a Stradivarius, you would walk by that and you're like, $1,000? First of all, I don't play the violin and that looks like a piece of junk. And if you didn't know that it was a Stradivarius, you would not realize that you just walked away from one of the most valuable items on the planet. I would argue that many people will look at you in the same way. Because Paul says that Christ chose the weak things of the world to confound the wise. That's you and I. You and I are weak. According to the world, we don't have a lot of value. We don't have a lot of significance. We're not driven by wealth. And Christ said, your value is not in that. I see something that's value because I knew you before you were created and I created you for a purpose and that in of itself is valuable. So I want you on Friday to look at that last action, adopt Christ's love, go to that passage and listen to what God has to say for you. Will you please bow with me? Heavenly Father, as we, we come together, I, I acknowledge something I said earlier, that it's possible that someone online or in present has not put their faith in you. And Father, your word is not meant to be offensive. It's to be corrective. It's, it's to show us that if we've not put our faith in you, that we are darkened. We don't understand the spiritual world. It's not until we enter into that to receive your spirit that you begin to give us understanding and clarity about what really matters, especially what matters for eternity's sake. So I'm asking that they would open their heart right now confess their sins, pray for you to forgive them and come into their lives and grant them eternal life 
and a new purpose. But for the rest of my brothers and sisters, in light of something I alluded to, if any of them are stuck, they're discouraged, they're feeling hampered, they've gone back to flirting with the world or looking to the world for their comfort, encourage them today, strengthen them, fortify them to go forward, to confess whatever they need to and trust that you have a path of holiness, of righteous, of living that is meaningful and profitable. It's in your son's name I pray, amen.